Welcome to Mayflower Congregational United Church of Christ, where we believe that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. This Pentecost Sunday, the Kansas-Oklahoma Conference of the UCC is orchestrating a pulpit exchange among all of our congregations, and so we sent Robin to preach to the good people of the Federated Church in Weatherford, Oklahoma, and we are lucky to have Reverend David Wheeler with us, also from Weatherford, who also has a joint responsibility down in Norman, and I'll tell you about that charge and David more later in the service. Pray with me. Gracious God, sometimes it is disturbing how relevant scripture can be. We would be more comfortable if it were a little less applicable to our own lives. In his letter to the church in Rome, Paul confessed, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I do not do what I want but I do the very thing I hate. We know the feeling, Paul. We want our children to pursue higher education, to be well-read and to be critical thinkers, but we are systematically defunding public education. We want our children to thrive, but not if we have to give up our guns. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. We want our teachers to feel appreciated, so once a year we take them coffee and donuts, but we continue to deny them respectable pay and the resources to do their jobs. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. We want people to be able to defend themselves against tyrannical government, but we shrug our shoulders when Palestinians are murdered for throwing rocks. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. We want to honor mothers because we know their sacrifices so often go unacknowledged, but we refuse to insist on gender pay equality while we are making it harder for low-income families to get health care and put food on the table. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. We want to be known as a Christian nation, but we pass laws that deny children access to loving homes in the name of religion tear children from the arms of their parents at the border, and deny agency to women over their own bodies, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And yet, and yet on the eve of Pentecost, an African-American bishop quoted both a French Jesuit priest and Martin Luther King Jr. at a British royal wedding. It's enough to make us think there is still hope. So on this Pentecost Sunday, this day of second chances, fresh starts, and new vision, help us, help us, Holy One, to be everything the church is supposed to be. We can, as Bishop Curry said, make of this old world a new world. Amen. We are so delighted to have with us the Reverend David Wheeler, who has pastored a wide array of congregations ranging from 13 to 7,500 members over 20 years. He has spoken at numerous regional and national events and served as a strategic consultant to congregations seeking to expand or rejuvenate their ministries. He has a track record of bringing revitalization to the congregations he has served. David earned a Master of Arts in Spiritual Formation from Northwest Nazarene University and a Master of Divinity from Phillips Theological Seminary in Tulsa. He has served churches in Washington State, Arkansas, Texas, and Oklahoma, and is currently serving two of our sister congregations, the Federated Church in Weatherford and First Congregational UCC in Norman. So you may think, oh, this pulpit exchange, David really drew the short end of the stick. He's got to do two services at Mayflower, but this is way better than driving 65 miles to Weatherford, back, and then 30 to Norman. You're welcome, David. (laughs) 
David is married to Cherie Wheeler, an elementary music educator who is with us this morning, and they are the proud parents of Isaac and Joshua. David is a dear friend and co-heretic, and someone I can call on to help make trouble, and he always answers. So we are so glad to have you with us this morning. Please help me welcome Reverend David Wheeler. And now, if you'll turn with me to Romans, I'll be reading from chapter 8, verses 22 through 27. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Here ends the reading inspired by God, May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Lori, and good morning, my dear Mayflowerites, or is it Mayflowerians? I'm not quite sure. Either way, it's truly an honor to be here uh, with you today. I pass on greetings as well from your spiritual siblings at the Norman and Weatherford, Oklahoma, United Church of Christ congregations where I serve. I should warn you first that I consider both of your reverends, Walkie and Myers, to be among my personal friends. Preachers don't have that many friends, you see. <laughs> And we are preachers, after all, and who really wants to be friends with preachers, right? I warn you of our friendship's first thing today so that you might understand it when I say a, a couple of things, perhaps at their expense, before I officially begin this sermon. First, for those who were both present and listening last week, and if you were listening, may your tribe increase. Um, <laughs> I know that Robin Myers has already told you that it's all his fault that you must endure my preaching today. Um, he had been hinting for quite some time, you see, to Edith Guffey, our United Church of Christ conference minister, that a pulpit swap, a conference-wide pulpit swap would be a good idea. And so I guess this idea, much like a fungus, finally grew on our conference minister. And here I am, and this morning... Robin is in Weatherford right now. It's also wise of me at the outset of this message today to make certain that I stay in the good graces of Reverend Walkie because tomorrow morning I will be playing on her golf team at Mayflower's Golf Tournament to raise money for the Brewer Memorial Scholarship Fund. It has been a couple years since she has seen my golf game and it's really ugly and shocking. And so when I realized that Robin's absence from this chancel area would create a clear victory for Lori to declare best hair game on the chancel, <laughs> I, yeah, it's true, I considered it a great win for her and really for me to have the luscious locks of Robin Myers preaching at Weatherford today. <laughs> She definitely wins best hair on the chancel, hands down, or should we say follicles down. And I hopefully win goodwill with her so that tomorrow when I'm feeding my golf balls to the ponds and to the forests and to the sand traps, maybe you'll still be my friend. Enough of this petty preacher banter. I come before you today, this Pentecost Sunday 2018, with a deeply important life-altering theological question for you. I ask you to keep an open mind. You folks at Mayflower are known, known allegedly for this kind of thing, so here it goes. Are you ready? What did you hear? Yanny or Laurel? <laughs> Do you even know what I'm talking about? 
For those with social media accounts, it would be difficult, but not impossible, perhaps, to have missed the ongoing Yanni versus Laurel debate that began last week. Wired magazine solved part of the mystery Wednesday when it revealed that the origins of this audio recording in question and where they came from, Katie Hetzel, a freshman at Flowery Branch High School in Georgia, had a question about one of her vocabulary words. Laurel, I knew I was hearing it the right way. She looked it up on vocabulary.com and she played the little audio clip right from her computer and it came through the speakers. But instead of the word in front of her, what she heard instead of Laurel was Yanny. At least that's how it was reported. She said, I asked my friends in my class and we all heard mixed things. She posted an audio clip of that link on her Instagram story. Another student republished it as a poll. Then a friend put it on Reddit, thus sparking this national debate. On a personal note, I have already hinted to you, I clearly hear Laurel, as God intended. (laughs) However, I was relieved to find out that there were actually respectable human beings who were hearing Yanny. I was greatly relieved that they were hearing Yanny and not what I feared at first, which was Yanni, that Greek musician, hunk figure who's famous for elevator music and the like, and uh, you know who I'm talking about. I, I, I was afraid that if they were saying Yanni that this might repopularize elevator music, and I was scared <laughs> what that could do to the moral fabric of our society. My apologies to any Yanni fans or elevator music fans. I could actually never have dreamed of a better illustration for Pentecost Sunday during this sermon than the whole Laurel versus Yanni debate this week. Because on Pentecost, we celebrate that occasion when people were gathered in Jerusalem from all around and they spoke different languages. They had completely different customs. But this time, though they were speaking in different languages, unlike the Yanni versus Laurel debate, quite the opposite, they all ended up hearing the same thing. They all experienced, if only for a moment, unity, a moment where heaven and earth seemed to be so close, close enough that it changed the course of history. As a people these days, we earthlings have become so incredibly polarized. If you can believe it, Not even all of the yapping back and forth in the whole Laurel versus Yanny debate was good-natured. I know some people, maybe even some under my roof, that disagreed rabidly. And some maybe carried it too far. Surely it wasn't me. Do you ever discuss your views on stuff, important stuff? World events, let's say, with family members or friends or co-workers... And you hear a few words out of their mouth and you just say, how do we even share the same planet? It's like we speak different languages completely. And no matter how hard some of us try, we only hear Laurel or Yanny. A perfect illustration of these differences was easily seen, especially through social media, yet again after yet another tragic school shooting in Santa Fe, Texas. On my social media feed, I saw instantly mixtures of posts that ranged from thoughts and prayers to you'll never take my guns to Obama didn't get your guns, but I sure as heck am coming for them kinds of posts. And I'll confess, I wonder sometimes, do we even speak the same language? Also this past week, another illustration when the President of the United States made some very hurtful remarks about immigrants when he said, these aren't people, these are animals. Now some have said, and it's probably the case, that these words were in reference to MS-13, international criminal gang members which are being deported. It may well be. However, my take on the Christian faith holds that it is dehumanizing to refer to any person, criminal or not, as an animal. 
My point's not actually the remarks, but rather our response to these kinds of remarks that illustrates our differences. We are vastly different, and yet at some level we are all the same. With such different opinions on the same event, how, how do we even know that we speak the same language? Or take, for example, here in our own state. I know Lori mentioned in her prayer a moment ago so aptly that here in Oklahoma where Governor Fallon just signed into law a bill which makes it possible for faith-based adoption and foster agencies to discriminate against single parents, parents of other faith traditions, members of the LGBTQ community because, well, and here's the hurtful part, because of their religious beliefs. Some Christians apparently think their religious beliefs are more important than the children having loving homes or the separation of church and state or celebrating the equality of all human beings. But what do I know? I only hear Laurel. It's like those of us who favor a radically inclusive love of God that knows no boundaries or borders speak a different language from others, even Christians who have a rather narrow view of God's love based on strict rule following. Most of the time, those same folks get to make the rules. <laughs> those who favor an inclusive faith, an inclusive approach to life where we say with our attitudes, hopefully, and our actions as well as our words, draw the circle wide. Draw it wider still, and it seems to it's so different. It's such a contrast to folks who also call, may even call themselves Christians who seemingly only draw circles to keep others out. If we're completely honest, after a while, this gets painful. It is painful because we know that harm is being done, and it's especially painful when we know that harm is being done with God's name attached to it. It's far worse than a casual debate over Yanni versus Laurel. It is a mortal wound very near to the heart of our faith. Do you ever feel pain that you're pretty sure is caused by the brokenness that seems to surround us in this world in which we live? Do you ever catch yourself groaning, sighing, despairing, wishing hoping things could somehow be different. If you have, you are in very good company. Hear these words again from Romans 8, 26. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. Let that beautiful metaphor sink in for just a moment. Groans and sighs happen when people are in pain and are feeling overwhelmed. The Apostle Paul is saying here that when the hopelessness of this world causes you to be at a loss for words, to sigh, to groan, to despair, the Spirit also does it with us and in us and even through us. We do not give thanks for the reasons that we feel this pain and for the overwhelming sense of injustice in the world and all of the brokenness that accompanies this, but we can be thankful that when we are groaning and sighing and are in pain and at a loss for words, we are in fact participating in the same work alongside the Spirit of God. In this way, friends, when we hurt with the world's hurts, when we hurt with the world's injustices, we are all part of a collective conscience of the universe, a sort of divine conspiracy of justice and compassion. And so when we see pain and brokenness and we feel it in the pit of our stomachs, this, my companions, is proof that the image of God resides and the Spirit of God resides in each and every one of us. In verse 22, Paul says, we are all connected, deeply, inseparably connected. 
Chief Seattle of the Suquamish tribe once put it this way, all things are bound together, all things connect. Whatever happens to the earth happens to the children of the earth. The Apostle Paul put it this way in verse 22 of Romans 8, the whole of creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And I believe it still is today. We all groan and long for a day when divisions will not separate us and when we will all finally at long last work for inclusion, for reconciliation, for justice, for peace, for love, as Bishop Curry so eloquently put it yesterday at the royal wedding. As people who follow the way of Jesus, we long and hope for the beloved community And yet we live constantly between the reality of what we know to be happening now and what could be, what will be, when this vision of the beloved community becomes a reality. But my friends, in between, in the here and now, the world can be a very painful place sometimes. Albert Schweitzer called the realization of our interdependence and interconnectedness the reverence of life. Not all of us have it just yet. And yet, we are all connected, whether we realize it or not. We are all bound together in our humanity and as a part of creation. It is the work of the Spirit in us and through us to open our eyes to the places the world is broken and to hurt right along with it. Some people call this basic human decency. Others call it compassion, and it is. Compassion and connectedness, the work of the Spirit. It starts with an awareness of what truly is and moves us along further into compassion and hopefully action that would help bring healing and wholeness to this broken mess of ours. Now, in addition to reminding us of our complete interconnectedness, the Apostle Paul has something else very important to remind us of this fine Pentecost morning. As followers of the way of Jesus, as a people of the Spirit, not only should we realize our interconnectedness, even with the people who hear Laurel when we hear Yanny, but we are called also to hold on to hope even as we groan for a more loving, a more just, and a more peaceful world. We are called to be people of a radical optimism. Now already some of you are thinking, well, that sounds artificial. You can't be happy all the time. I'm not suggesting that. So let me say a few things about hope. If you can see it, it's not hope. This is where so many thinking Christians get hung up, I think. But I'm not talking about magic either or hocus pocus, but rather I'm talking about a foundational belief in hope that requires a willingness to trust that which is not always empirically verifiable. Some of us thought that was faith, but we were wrong. Faith, in the context of the broadest scriptural sense of the word, is most often faithfulness or right action. But hope, hope, is believing the world still has a chance to be something more loving, more peaceful, more just than it currently appears. And hope, my friends, will make people do some pretty crazy, awesome things. Some of you Mayflowerites, or was it Mayflowerians, did we decide? Are incredibly and crazily hopeful people. I did my homework on you folks. I did a little nosing around. You thought you called a guest preacher, but you got a guest stalker. How is that? (laughs) And it's obvious that you people here are crazy enough to believe in hope. Because hope is the thing that will drive you to do things like participate in rebuilding together. Hope is the kind of thing that will drive you to do what you already are doing and deliver mobile meals, to tutor some children in reading skills at WizKids, to be a part of the Taft Morning Arts Program and the Food Pantry, to serve in partnership like so many of you do with the Homeless Alliance, or to spread love in a hands-on fashion with the Prayer Shawl Ministry, or maybe even to raise your voice 
and civic engagement through voice. You see, hope for this world is the kind of thing that will drive people like you, and I've seen you there because I've been there, to stand in front of an unmarked immigration office every single Wednesday at noon and to pray and to sing and to testify that God knows no borders and loves us all exactly the same no matter where we're from. It's a kind of crazy hope that would cause Mayflower to become a sanctuary church, offering peace and safety to anyone needing shelter. Hope says, it's an ugly world out there sometimes, and yes, we even have Christians who seem to hear Yanny when all we know is really happening is Laurel. And yes, this world can be hazardous to one's mental health sometimes, living here in Oklahoma, where we still seem to crank out laws that cause more division, hatred, and damage. But hope says, we still believe a better way is possible. A better world is possible. And hope, when you leave this glorious building, might even cause you to eat lunch with that annoying, crazy coworker when it would be far more pleasant to eat at your desk and avoid their crazy opinions because maybe, just maybe one day, if you hold on to hope and not give up on them, one of them might experience a loss, a heartache, and because of hope, you'll be there, all crazy-eyed and hopeful and stuff, to show them compassion. And then they'll know what compassion looks like because you never gave up and you endured mountains of their clearly incorrect political ideology and their clearly misled theology in order to bring a little hope. Conventional wisdom? Oh, it says they'll never change. The world is a lost cause. But the foolishness of the gospel of Jesus is a gospel of hope that says to quote the great theological work we know as Dumb and Dumber. (laughs) So you're telling me there's a chance. (laughs) A chance they'll finally hear Yanny instead of Laurel, or is it the other way around? I'm not sure which it is for certain, but I do know, friends, that we're stuck together, inseparably connected by design, And at Pentecost, we cling to hope because we believe a better world is possible. That's the spirit. That's who we are. It's who we're called to be. Thanks be to God. Amen.